You were listening to the Never Meet Your Heroes podcast, conversations with artists about their work and inspiration. I am your host, Anthony Moses Sanchez. So with me today, I have Raul Pizarro, not to be confused with pizza. (laughs) (laughs) Not Pizarro. (laughs) So uh, say hi to to the audience. Hello, everyone. Um, so let's go ahead and have you introduce yourself, um, how you got it, like where you're from okay. and how you describe your, your, your work. Well, my name is Roald Pizarro. I am from Pomona. Um, I'm a painter. I paint mostly naked people, <laughs> but lately, well, actually like the past six years, it's been mostly bears, naked bears. Hmm. <laughs> Naked bears. Yes. Um, when did you start painting? I started painting when I was probably in preschool. Okay. So well, didn't we all though? Like, I think. oh yeah. <laughs> so in preschool, was that when you got kind of you realized I really want to do this no. all the time? Well, no. I just always well I did just want to do it all the time, but I didn't realize that I wanted to do it as a career until I was in my mid twenties. Maybe early 20s. Okay. Yeah. Um, what was that turning point for you to realize that, that was your passion? Um, it was mostly a physical thing because I wasn't able to go to school to finish what I was studying. Okay. And all I could do to cope was to paint, which was the thing I did throughout my whole life. Okay. And then um, I just started sharing it through through uh, art galleries because one of my friends kind of got me into it and... Here we are. So at the art galleries here in Pomona, that's where yeah. you started? Yeah, the okay. first one was here in Pomona called the DAW, mm-hmm. um, Center for the Arts. It's a fantastic nonprofit gallery. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's, a fant- it's a really big open space that welcomes pretty much anyone. Okay, it, which is still one of the art galleries out here that's still open yeah. in 2017. Yep, it's one of the very last ones. Right. Um, even in downtown LA, there's still only a few open back to like 10 years ago or so. Um, so, and wh- how long ago was that when you did the DAW then? The DAW was probably, oh my gosh. Oh man, I don't know. It's been a long time. <laughs> um, maybe 13 years ago. Okay. I think, I'm not sure. Something and w- like that. What was the reaction to your art, your first piece? That um, I don't really remember because it was also when I discovered wine. <laughs> <laughs> the first time. So does that dovetail into what's your muse? <laughs> <laughs> yes, fermented grapes. <laughs> um, what was the first piece? What was the name of the first piece then? Well, I had three, okay. and they were all kind of like dark goddesses Mm -hmm. that one of course one of them was um kali Mm -hmm. which i've always kind of uh really appreciated because she felt like she was the most honest god when it came to the way life was in real life where for things to be rebuilt they have to be completely destroyed Mm. and that's she was pretty much my my favorite one and okay. the other two were just like mythical ones from stories I'd heard in my childhood, mm-hmm. stories from Mexico and stuff like that. So b- these were folklorish, yeah, like uh, La Llorona. Um, right. I don't remember what the third one was, but oh, Lilith. Okay, right, yeah. Lilith. <laughs> my favorite one. <laughs> my other favorite one. Um, and I'll. With your permission, we'll put some of these images okay. up for the podcast for people to, you know, if they, or of course they can look at the website too. Um, so that that was the start, and you kind of just got addicted from there, from the show, or w- w- what was what kept you going? Um, well, I was painting either way. I was painting mm. a lot, mm. but it it kind of like it was the best way to introduced me to gallery life and exhibiting Mm -hmm. and what to expect and kind of just it was a good like icebreaker for me okay yeah i understand it was a coping thing too so yeah (laughs) but um you know some artists will do a show but you know they maybe the show didn't go quite as well so you know 
keep going and you've been you've continued to show your work in fact you had one this weekend a couple yeah. things this weekend so yes we've got another one coming up this saturday right i don't know what this will post so <laughs> <laughs> as <laughs> soon as i can by then. Yeah. <laughs> um so we talked about where you're from where you started your paintings um any what what so you have different periods would you say different interest themes that you've been painting yeah definitely i uh i kind of worried about that over time because i don't know if i'm supposed to like stick to certain themes the rest of my life and i just can't do that okay my brain doesn't work like that yeah but i think the three themes that have really kind of just whirled over my mind for the past few decades is are the first series I did where I worked with you and mm -hmm. the paintings, which the that series is called a Song for Deaf God. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do a series for Day of the Dead that's that I, I do pieces for every year. And then the one I've been on working on the past six to seven years is um, the Bear series. And do you want to talk about? Yeah. What we're going to talk about everything that you okay. want to talk. So we, let's talk about what you're currently working on then with your bear. Okay. Well, currently the, the bears are mostly, uh, they're kind of, they're about how we're all kind of feral in a way. We're all beasts mm -hmm. that we forget that we're also animals. And um, it's just, it's kind of like these moments where, we realize that we have experienced enlightenment in different moments and that's what each little painting is. And the reason I, I kind of wrap them in fuzziness and cuteness is because I feel like that's more approachable to a lot of people, especially lately. It seems like a lot of people are afraid or off or put off by um, uh, things that might feel too dark or things that they just don't really want to think about in art. Right. And I feel like I've kind of had to wrap it in fuzziness to be more approachable to some people. I and see. I also like bears. Well, <laughs> yeah. And so we're surround we're here in a studio in Pomona, um, and we have a lot of his artwork up here and you have like these sculptures. So that's also part of the same series that you yeah. Yeah, well, I started sculpting as well because I, I mean, I'd always wanted to do it, but I didn't know if I could. Uh -huh. And also because some of the paintings I was going to do, I didn't have like the correct lighting and I just couldn't figure out for the life of me how to make the fur work in certain scenes mm -hmm. or certain poses. So I sculpted them to light them and actually use them as little maquettes, little statues. Okay. Yeah, little little models. <laughs> So do you have a preference now between the sculpting or the painting? I love them both. You love them both? Yeah, they're both really... Well, usually during the daytime, I use most of my brain power to <laughs> to focus on painting and physical as well because I have more energy in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then towards the evening, I work mostly on sculpting just to relax. And Okay. Let's talk about how you continue to work. You, send, you, you get up in the morning, you, you mostly paint, you... Yeah. Uh, because the, like a lot of people would want to have questions about like how do you have the discipline like even like Neil Gaiman, the writer like you know just get up and and just start writing or, or stuff like that. So for you, you you chop up your day with just eight hours of painting, three hours right. of painting. What how does that? Um, well, I I usually I have like I said en more energy in the morning, um, and I. Uh, I don't know. It's mostly impulsive. I feel like I have to do it. And if I don't, I feel a lot of guilt. Mm. And it's, it's really weird. It's very Amish. but <laughs> I'm a very brown Amish person. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I really love doing it. And I think for me, it's, it's a way to kind of um, cope and fix parts of my brain that aren't working right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's, I just, it's just something I have to do. Okay. So could you even say, looking back at what you painted so far, that they 
tell a part of um, what was going on psychologically for you? Yeah, um, I think most people wouldn't know that, even people that I know. Okay. Like, um, like close friends still don't know what the paintings are about. They just, you know, mm -hmm. they either like them or they don't. Like almost all of us, when we see something, we're just attracted to it or we just keep on right. moving. Um, but yeah, each one is definitely um, kind of my diary of, of where I was at that point and kind of honoring it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's moments that are kind of embarrassing, but I feel like they're also important that there are things that need to be addressed and, you know, we can't become who we we want to be without, you know, going through this awkwardness or ugly moments or whatever they are. Right, right. With your different paintings so far, what has been your favorites? Oh my gosh, um, specific paintings? Um, or, or a or, period, but yeah, specific, maybe just in a, even if it's just like you mentioned earlier when you started, you had your first three or... Mm -hmm. um, well, my first ones I'm very embarrassed about. When I look, okay. When I look back at them, mm -hmm. they're really crude, um, but that's where I was and... I mean, there's nothing wrong with being crude, I guess, but... Crude uh, stylistically, technically? I think Is mostly that... when it came to the ideas behind them. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's a little embarrassing. I see. Okay. I I mean, I feel like uh, when I li was listening to Depeche Mode's first album on my way over here, and like how it sounds like... A little kid trying to sound like craft work <laughs> i think it's a normal you know i think now the band looks back at it and is like wow we were <laughs> we were 16 17 right <laughs> yeah it's it's the work you have to put in you got right do it. Where, where do you feel like you've made the most growth at what point and what paintings then do you for feel me like? definitely it was uh, when when i started working on songs for a deaf god mm-hmm um, because I had to take it to a whole new level when it came to um, my painting technique as well. Mm -hmm. I had avoided it for a really long time because details are time-consuming, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to invest that much time in staying home. Mm -hmm. I was a lot younger, and I, like many people, just wanted to go have fun. Right. <laughs> and so I didn't want to commit to something where I'd have to start and stay there for hours and hours and hours, possibly the entire day. Okay. Um, but when I finally did that, it wasn't just that, but it was also the fact that I had to own what was going on with my life. I see. And a lot of people who see my work in galleries don't know that I actually have muscular dystrophy. Okay. They don't know anything about me, which I kind of liked at that point because I didn't want people to like my work because, oh, he's the guy in the wheelchair. Look at what he can do. Mm -hmm. it's you know it's so inspiring or whatever um which is kind of gross after a while if it's for the wrong reason it's gross like if it's if it's like if it's inspiration just because i do something just because i'm disabled it's kind of like whatever mm -hmm. but yeah so it, that's something i had to tackle with that series that and and what i believed in in life in general and how i separated my life from from church mm -hmm. i was raised in a very uh astringent religion um and for a long time i wanted to kind of like make amends with that and i think that was when i finally started doing that where i wasn't angry anymore i wasn't um just confused about it I, everything just made sense and i had to write about it i mean paint about it and mm -hmm. yeah that's what the series about is about so the the first painting in the series uh, is what what's the title of the first painting in that the song of the death? Um, it's songs for deaf songs god. Songs for deaf god. That's so that one is that's also the first time I, I had anyone pose for me. Oh okay, <laughs> and um, it was yeah it was it was something I was scared to do that because I I didn't really know how to work with it person who was nude in my house <laughs> it's kind of uncomfortable but um we just kind of like we just did it you know and and it was awkward for the first few minutes but then 
once you realize that there's all these other technical things you have to work on, like lighting and all that stuff, you kind of forget. And the body almost becomes like, I don't want to say a prop, but like this vessel that you have to put in the right light. And mm -hmm. yeah, it just, it becomes the art that you're looking for. And yeah, it was, it, that's the one. Sorry, I just went out of contention. <laughs> no, that's perfect. <laughs> Welcome to my life. <laughs> <laughs> so you there's several things that happened for you artistically then it sounds like you um were dealing with overcoming your religious stuff in the past mm -hmm. um you were changing technically right. or challenging yourself as far as giving yourself more time putting away your your free time slowly and focusing more on the art and then um working with models right so that kind of was becoming that was the beginning of when you feel like you were more mature with your work versus the first three paintings that you mentioned earlier where you felt like yeah i didn't know what i was doing <laughs> right yeah i didn't feel like a hobby at that point okay or just like a willy-nilly thing i just I, I felt very committed to it and i invested in in it not just like time-wise but material-wise and i did a little more research and making sure that I'm doing things right. Okay. How many paintings do you think you've done to date then? Oh my gosh. I have no idea. I've been really, really bad at um, keeping track of that or mm. I, I really don't know. Right. <laughs> I'd it's, say it's it's in probably the hundreds for sure. In the hundreds? Yeah, because usually I'd only count the ones that were larger. Mm. Um, but there's there's so many smaller paintings I've done that. And you've also had commissioned work. Yeah, lots and lots of commission work that I'm not really working on right now. I, I really just want to work on my own stuff. Right. I finally was able to do that um, this past year, and it's been pretty cool. It's really liberating. That's great. And one thing I think that people that aren't as familiar with the painting process is one painting could be, what, how many like months, would you say, oh, yeah. like in a large painting? Yeah. Because you, you do have you do kind of tend to have more larger paintings in general. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, the, it's also, um, it depends on, it's not just the height. Sometimes it's also in the technique because when I, for example, like the songs for deaf God series, when it's mostly, it's all people mm -hmm. and they're, they're, I think they're all nude. Actually, most of them, there might be one that isn't, but most of them are all nude. And the thing with, with the body and, and painting flesh is that, for me, I like to make it look seamless, mm -hmm. which is all like smoke and mirrors. It's not the way it's actually painted. So I have to, my preferred technique with that is called glazing. And so that's when you pretty much like lay down um, some color and then you have to wait for that to dry before you can add another one because it's like glass over glass. Mm -hmm. And so some of those took up to like six months. They took a really long time. Okay. And then the larger ones took a long time just because they were so huge and I can't reach them. So I had to like flip them on their side, uh -oh. upside down. Interesting. Kind of looked like a chihuahua trying to get busy with a German shepherd. So you took the canvas <laughs> and you had to flip it completely upside down? Yeah, upside is down. It? Or because I, I mean, I'm the highest I can get with my chair is maybe like another foot okay. higher than where I'm at. And, and the last painting I did is six feet tall. Wow. So, which is the largest one I've done to okay. date. But yeah, it, they can take a long time. That one took about five months. Which one are you talking about? The yeah. one behind you. It's like a, oh, it's, it's, a it's a large grizzly bear mm -hmm. that's got a small like panda cub in front of it. And he's kind of like weary of releasing the, the panda bear. And the mm -hmm. panda bear is kind of like ready to go but also a little unsure and there's a bunch of uh, literature on the ground and literature is in almost all of the the bear series okay did you want to expound on oh sure the... um that is mostly because i feel like that's all of our stories and it's it's every every other story that's been told and the importance behind knowing all of the history um that we've been given through time okay. or that we can give as well so the, that's the largest painting you've done and then you're talking about the history um 
Actually, Any technically, other? I guess the mural next to me is the largest one I've done. That's of, about eight feet. Of Erica Badu? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. It's, they can't see this. It's Yeah. <laughs> It's a, a portrait of Erica Badu in my living room. Well, which no one will ever see unless they come in here, right? <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> um, so with the literature and history, was there anything else about the history that was interesting to you? That like, Are you putting different types of... I haven't seen all of the, the Bear series, but um, just books, are, are they always represented the same? How, um, no, it's not always books. Some of them are are tools that are used in mapping things out or nautical searches and um there's also lots of stars in there mm -hmm. mapping the stars and yeah it's it's pretty much wonder wondering about life and the universe and where we fit into all of it how many more paintings do you have in, in mind for that series well right mm -hmm. now i have about Three exactly that I'm sketching out, and I I said that I was going to stop working on it just so I can get back to working on this series of um, Sangshur Deaf God okay. people, <laughs> but I just can't seem to pull myself away from it yet. So I don't want to just stop just because I feel like I it's expected. I feel like I want to do it when it feels like it's right, and maybe I can do both at the same time. Yeah, work on both series. Yeah, so, I mean. We recorded, I mean, we took photos for a painting we were going to work on together. You and I, yeah. Yeah, like years ago. And I still want to work on that. I've actually got about three paintings that I want to work with. I, there's another, a couple other friends as well mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm just waiting to do them. Right. <laughs> it's the the struggle of any artist, though. Right. You know, you, you want to do everything there's all the stuff that you're never going right. to get to do. There's like yeah, and you also want to do it when it's the right time, you know, because mm -hmm. you're going to be investing so much of yourself. And you, I personally, I don't want to do it out of um, begrudgingly, like towards myself. I just want to know that my brain is there and my heart's there and, mm -hmm. you know, time as well is there to do it. I mean, yeah. Do you feel like there's a difference between like... Um, you know, gay men love discussing pop queens and stars <laughs> and, um, you know, the difference between like, let's, let's put this example out there. Sorry, Lady Gaga, but a lot of people <laughs> felt like art pop and she admitted it. She rushed it out. She wasn't, her heart wasn't in it. You don't want to, you don't want to release art pop, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all released our art pop. Sure. <laughs> we've already done it. <laughs> um, what do you feel even... I mean, between the two, you definitely have, I got a sense that your inspiration for um, Songs for a Deaf God, am I saying that right already? Yeah. <laughs> um, versus, what are you calling your bear series? Are you, is it just the bears? Or? I, the, the, initially, I called it Teatro del Mundo, mm -hmm. which is um, Latin for th theater of the world. Right, right. And I felt like that was the perfect platform. Mm-hmm for what I wanted to do with the bears. Okay. Yeah. And it's not just bears, actually. I've, I've used a few other animals as well. Mm -hmm. But the bears are the ones that I've actually done most of. Right. I relate to them the most, like more than an octopus. <laughs> I've been a few octopus, octopi, but the bears are... Would you feel that the uh, if somebody said that bears are your spirit animal, would they be right? Uh, no, they wouldn't. No. No, no. <laughs> it's definitely... Um, Wait, this is going to be recorded. I probably shouldn't say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. <laughs> My spirit animal is a person. Okay. A famous person. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. We uh, we don't want to we don't want to ruin your career on one podcast. Um. So, what, what do you feel? How do you who who's influenced you the most though, as far as painting, music? I, I mean. Anything there's been so sp many. specific. There's been so so many. Um, there's been people I've met that I've I've had to paint. And there's um, almost everyone I've painted in in Songshur Deaf God. There was a reason why I thought they would be perfect for it. Mm -hmm. um, and they definitely inspired 
a, a lot of what went into the painting because usually when I started a painting, I'd, I'd have like this idea of what I wanted to do, but I liked the idea of keeping it organic so it didn't feel fake or stagnant. I wanted it to, there's just something really enjoyable about working on something and seeing it grow while you're working on it. Right. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that really inspired me, mm -hmm. inspires me, like still when I'm working on certain paintings. So Songs for Deaf God was definitely inspired by people I've met, um, places I've, you know, experienced, things I've experienced in life. And the, the bears are mostly inspired by um, things that I remember from my childhood. Um, and my nephew, for sure. I, when, um, when he was born was probably like one of the toughest times for me physically because that's when I lost the ability to walk, which I'd feared almost my entire life. I, I, I mean, I knew it was coming because I've had friends who, I mean, had muscular dystrophy and you just see like the way it progresses and what to expect. And, you know, I knew it was going to happen, but when it finally did, there was lots of challenges that came with that, not just physically, but mentally and things, just a lot of junk that I wasn't aware I was carrying around. Mm. And when my nephew was born, they actually lived next door. So seeing the way he experienced life from the beginning and the things he'd ask for from us just really kind of like brought me back to a better place where I could see where li where love is born and who we can be and just seeing the way that wander begins in, mm -hmm. in, in our minds and things that we kind of forgotten as adults, mm -hmm. things that are just really fascinating and beautiful. And yeah, so he was definitely the muse for, for that series in the beginning. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a, a difference as far as the childlike element of the, um, Teatro del Mundo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> My Spanish is terrible. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, just from from our own friends, I've noticed people are like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. They're like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> well, most people say that you should start a children's book. Yeah. Like, just to give the people listening um, who aren't familiar with the work yet, just it looks right. like something that, that you know. It, but, it, you know, I, I don't think that was your intention to, no. to write a children's book Not with the all. images. <laughs> so. Right. But I can, I totally understand why why folks would think that. Because it, the the images do lend themselves to to illustrations for children's book, mm -hmm. but that was definitely not the the route. But who knows? I mean, I do want to publish something with with that series, and I've 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 written a few ideas for it and different stories, but I can't really commit to any of them yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see. Right. <laughs> well, I'm sure an opportunity will present itself <laughs> um so let's see what else do we got here so who are your artistic heroes if you have oh there's so many um painting wise i love simone gad i love her work that she does with hollywood and things she finds and the way she brings them together i love gronk stuff gronk yeah. uh last name Gronk. Just just Gronk. Go, oh, that's yeah. right. He just goes by Gronk. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And he's a Chicano, uh, well, East LA 70s, what, his period. Right? I think he's just amazing. Okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> You're that's like, fantastic. I think it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> um, I also love uh, Kara Walker. Kara Walker? I love Kara Walker's work. What do you like about Kara Walker's work? I love how in your face it is mm -hmm. and truthful it is. And I feel like a lot of people, including myself, are sometimes afraid to see graphic truth of our of history. 
-hmm. because I mean we see America or we're supposed to think that we're like the best country ever and we've got a lot of darkness in our history mm -hmm. and even now we've got a ton of darkness happening and, and I feel like her work just you have to face it when when you see her work and you can't really shy away from it and um, I, that's what I love about her just like how unafraid she is to do what she wants or say what she wants to say through her work can you describe to me like one piece in particular that come like that's um, very yeah. strong to so you there's uh, there's an entire space inside of the Broad mm -hmm. in downtown LA that has her work and it's an antebellum mural. I'm not sure how I would describe it, but they're all silhouettes, which I'm pretty sure she's done quite some time now. And they're all different series of atrocities that happened in the South with slavery. And um, it, you're just surrounded by it. And there's no way of looking away from it when you're inside of that, that space. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's something that we have to face and see as Americans, mm -hmm. um, as humans, to acknowledge what's happened and, you know, just the repercussions from it. And I really like that you can't look away from it in that space because I feel like in, in our normal lives, that's what we normally do. We just look at other things or just distract ourselves and it's easy to forget what's happened, the histories of, you know, all these lives that been, have been, like, destroyed and affected in generations that it's kind of, like, you know, reached towards. And, I mean, I, I'm, that's what I like about her is just how brave she is. And her work is just fantastic in and of itself. <laughs> um, any other heroes that you... Art-wise, there's a lot. Um, writers, I love Marisela North is one of my favorites um, Poet What's, uh, Los Angeles Describe some of the poetry that, that it... Or what it makes you feel like Well, I I think I wouldn't do it justice If I <laughs> went on my like loopiness I think it'd be better to experience So if anyone has like the time to look into it, I think you should check out Money Sloan wrote this work. It's fantastic. I feel like as a Latino from and and in in America and, and living as an American, um there are certain pieces in there that I, I really I really uh connected with when it came to my comes to my experience as well growing up and just trying to find myself through that spectrum on either way either side and she just she just does it beautifully with her work not i mean that's just one of the pieces she has so right. many pieces but mm -hmm. and um let's see other in the arts music for sure i think i'm mostly inspired by music i love bjork mm. Um, I will always love Bjork. She can do no wrong in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh gosh, there's so many. I love folk music. Lately, I've been listening to lots of folk. Any particular artists? Um, in yeah, folk music? Uh, her name is Iris Dement, and Iris Dement really resonates with me because her music kind of reflects my my teenage years mm. growing up within the church mm. and she's atheist but she was also raised pentecostal mm -hmm. which was very similar to to my experience and um the way she sings about it is the way that i feel like i paint the series for song for deaf god mm -hmm. where um she addresses the problematic things that she had to deal with mm -hmm. within the church. Mm -hmm. 
and after the church as well, like when it came to trying to explain that to people who are still in the church, mm. or it, it's it's um where you're you're not doing it to offend them. It's really more of a personal, right? Um, you know, truth for yourself, and I that's what I really love about her music. And she talks about um, well, one of them is about the moment where she realized that God wasn't real mm. for herself. And then I think one of the lyrics is, uh, um, not worrying about, or not worrying about prayer because God is going to do what he's going to want to do anyway. Right. About, and it's about death. And one of her brothers was like injured really badly and how, like no matter how much they prayed, God was going to do whatever, you know, when she realized that, you know, maybe, prayer doesn't work maybe Mm. things just are what they are and maybe it's easier just to accept the moment Mm -hmm. and whatever your truth is or the truth actually is and that's kind of what i felt like in my early 20s where i felt like um i was falling a lot and uh, when I would fall i wouldn't be able to get back up because i have no Mm. arm strength when it like above my uh, my knees and so one of the times I fell, it was really bad, and I was by myself, and I, it just like so happened that I fell like right in front of like um, the closet mirror, so it went all the way down to the floor, and I could see myself there, and there was like no way of avoiding this truth, and it was just one of those moments where I knew that no matter how much I prayed, or what I'd done in my past, um, good wise, like there was nothing that was going to help me at that moment. It was just me and the concrete and the blood and the truth and this and the reflection of that. And that's, I actually painted a portrait of that and I don't really show that one up because it's just, it's kind of, mm. it's one of those things I don't really like to remember because it was, maybe now it's better. But yeah, it, that one was called Concrete Baptism. Mm hmm. Because my first baptism, well, I've had two because initially we were Catholic and right. the whole baby thing, not going to hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is good, baby shouldn't be in hell. <laughs> <laughs> Unless the, what's the Pat Benatar song? Ch- oh, ch- ch- uh, children to go hell to is hell. for children? Hell is for children. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Fantastic. <laughs> um, and then the second time I was baptized was within the church. At 14, and the whole idea with that with that was to be like a new person and, you know, like being free of all those horrible sins you've committed before you're 14, which for me were like three. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe they were just like bad words or whatever. Right. Um, but the, the truest baptism for me was that moment, like when my skull met the concrete. <laughs> And the mirror, like, didn't let me, like, avoid that truth. And, yeah, that was, like, I don't know where we even started, but I just completely silenced <laughs> I derailed the entire no, interview. No, that's fine. So we kind of covered what, what who's been your greatest muse. That was a question that one of my friends had for you. Um, but we kind of w- covered some of that. And I asked you to think, what, what is your favorite piece, I guess? It's, like, a little bit, but... What, of your artwork so far, what's your favorite? I know mean, it's probably like every child is special, but do you have any particulars that you're very proud of? Or I there there are a few. I think it it kind of changes. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. depends on. I, don't know, I actually don't even know what it depends on. Maybe where I'm at mentally, but I'm looking around, and I think my favorites are actually in this room with us right now excellent <laughs> one of them is a portrait of, of you that we worked on the first mm-hmm. one and um actually most of them are from that series come to think of it okay but i think the ones that sorry the ones that i think um that i i kind of love a lot are the one of you with the butterfly right um, the one behind me, Silicon Avenue Prayer, which is, uh, I, I'll try to describe it. It's um, it's a memory of my childhood. I grew up on 
a street that that was kind of like a a red light district of sorts um where it was like right on on county line between okay. like Los Angeles County and then an empire all right and neither police department wanted to really do anything about that right. space so when that happens i guess pretty much anything can go and it did mm-hmm. this was also the 80s mm. <laughs> when cocaine was <laughs> everywhere and fantastic i mean not that i was doing it at a child when yeah. i was eight but um yeah so i you know i had to go to special school since i was disabled and this was the 80s and we weren't supposed to be real normal kids because right. we were special you're special <laughs> yeah it's special um so I, i'd have to wait for the bus in front of the my house and that my street was where um sex workers would park their cars and sometimes do their business there as well like on the street mm-hmm. but there was also always this one woman that just i could not not stare at her there was just something about her presence that just it didn't haunt me it was just one of those things that just never left left my my memory and i remember being a kid and just always staring at her and my mom would turn my head away so mm-hmm. telling me not to be rude and to just pray for her and so those were two things that kept on coming back and that's what the painting is about it's it's a memory of her and a child that's praying in front of her Okay. And um, that's one of my favorites. And the one behind you is the one we talked about earlier with the grizzly and the panda bear. Okay. There's very strong memories around those two, it sounds like. Yeah, for okay. sure. Any of the heroes so far that you have met, and you did kind of share that with me before we started recording, there are some people, some famous, <laughs> we won't name names because this isn't TMZ <laughs> right. yet. <laughs> This, this this is the part where if anyone's waiting for any juicy gossip, you should turn up your stereo, <laughs> turn up your radio. Um, but any, anyone, because you, you've been in the art world for a while, so you've yeah. run into different people. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's notorious that, you know, certain people you you look forward to meeting and it doesn't quite work out. So It's disastrous. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and share um, there's blind item here. A, well, there's, <laughs> when it, okay, in the arts... Definitely, there was a couple of um, actors I, I really admired until I met. And we were just like the worst people on the planet <laughs> in person. <laughs> um, I don't know if they were just having a bad day or if they're just complete jerks. Um, you know, though, but when it comes to the arts world, like painting and artists that I've really looked up to, there hasn't been any that have disappointed okay at all like they i've fangirled times 10 when i met them and they were just like the coolest people and yeah artists are awesome <laughs> okay well so so, fo- so far it's been mostly a, a positive experience yeah then. except for those two others but whatever <laughs> so the two yeah. others was one experience with one particular person or i'm um, sorry i'm not getting like well two at the same time they were both at the same <laughs> this like turning, down, turning it sounding yeah. sexual. Yeah, they were at the yeah, same time. There was three of us, <laughs> and it was actually in the back behind the theater. <laughs> no, it was just, it was just disappointing because, I mean, they were kind of rude mm-hmm. and really dismissive and mm. just not very impressive as human beings. Okay, well, let's go on to something more positive, <laughs> and as we kind of get towards the end here. Um, who are some artists that you enjoy that you're keeping an eye on? I know you mentioned a few, but I feel like those are kind of like your your high up here. Like it's probably some people that maybe like some up and coming, I think is what the question is. Artists hmm. that you're kind of got your eye on, you're keep checking in on them, yeah. stalking them. <laughs> <laughs> Going through their trash. <laughs> Not that that's weird or anything. No, it's totally normal. I'm going through your <laughs> trash right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, there is one. Up and coming. I don't know if she's really up and coming or if she's already like a star. 
mm-hmm. but I love Erica Sonata's work. She's a sculptor, and she sculpts these little, um, well, not all little. Some of them are pretty big, but they're these really beautiful little puppies. They all look like they're newborn puppies, but they kind of look angelic and demonic at the same time. <laughs> Um, which I think is really fascinating because I feel like that's what we're kind of like as humans. Um, but yeah, I, I love her work a lot. It's, and so I, I've actually followed her quite a bit. And one of the emails I just received was through like a gallery asking me if I wanted one of her pieces and I couldn't afford it yet. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I know sometimes some artists are able to do trades. Mm-hmm. Um, Gaze and trade, right? <laughs> <laughs> Girl, that's another <laughs> podcast. <laughs> is it? I mean, it's art. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. It probably is. Knowing knowing the different types of uh, artwork that's out there, there probably is uh, an exhibition. Um, but, the, uh, you know, do you have a lot? Okay, then that's a good question as far as other yeah. artists who's mm-hmm. bought your art. Is there any, any name names that you would? Hmm. Name? Actually, most of the stuff that's, that I've sold, I don't know who they are because it's gone mm. through galleries. Okay. And most galleries don't tell you like who mm. bought what. So I really don't know. Maybe um, I've traded before with other artists, but I don't know if any of them have purchased it. Oh, mm. yeah, there is actually. Some um, some uh, folks here, some other artists here in Pomona. Okay. In the Arch Colony. Okay. For sure. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's probably easier because it's a smaller community here yeah, than, yeah. Definitely. And I definitely did not know, I guess it makes sense that the gallery wouldn't necessarily be like, by the way, yeah. so-and-so <laughs> bought your thing. So we can go around you and just sell. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right now, it's, um, it's a, they don't really share that stuff. Right. I guess I assume that maybe sometimes somebody would reach out to you personally and be mm-hmm. like, I'm interested in that work, uh, but I guess I understand. That's that, happened though. too. Um, okay. Like, uh, people have seen some of and i'm sure this happens with lots of artists and galleries like they'll they'll see your work and then they'll contact you instead of the gallery and um i actually don't do that because like Mm -hmm. if if it's through a gallery then i honor that it has to be through the gallery because it's a it's a business right um but they have they've they've asked me like you know if i could sell it to them without the gallery's commission Mm -hmm. and i don't do that because right the price is the price. Um, I feel like we're talking about other stuff right now. How's that? I don't know. It's like a, I'm, I'm like dishing on art right now. No, it's fine. <laughs> Let's dish. Let's a, we, we should. Um, <laughs> if anything, any galleries that are listening, right. he will, he's a loyal company man. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. You um, got to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, if anyone listening has any questions, um, you know, if you w- want to respond to Raul uh, on his, w- w- you have a website. What is your website? Yeah, your it's, it's my name. It's RaulPizarro.com. It's R-A-U-L-P-I-Z-A-R-R-O. And you can, there's like links on there for Facebook and mm. all social media through that website. Yeah, we're on everything but what? Periscope is gone. <laughs> Vine's gone. Wherever we're except where we need to be. Yeah. <laughs> if no one's into it anymore, we're if it's not if it's not publicly traded, we don't do it. We don't we don't use it. Um if it doesn't look good in a speedo, we're not there. <laughs> um so any questions there and also on our podcast we have at um never never meet your heroes podcast.com. Uh we also have on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um so any questions there? We're going to come back and talk to our old another time and answer those questions and follow up on any other things that we didn't cover on this particular recording. So thank you, Raul, uh, for being part of our, <laughs> our first recording. Mm-hmm. And um, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to Never Meet Your Heroes podcast. You can find us at nevermeetyourheroespodcast.com. Post comments, ask questions.